anyway, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Been joined today by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jarrett Ransom, CEO of the Raven Group, who has been so gracious in uh, letting me take some time off. We want to make sure we thank all of our presenting sponsors who allow us to be here every day. Jared said something really interesting several weeks ago, and I've been really thinking about it. Um, you know, these sponsors put no parameters on what we talk about. Uh, we have no editorial interference or guidance. Sometimes they'll say, hey, I met this interesting person, you ought to talk to them or whatever. But mm -hmm. that is it. And that's really, that's incredibly remarkable in any type of broadcasting. So again, we want to thank Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Be Generous, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and the Nonprofit Nerd. Again, catch us on Roku, YouTube, Vimeo, Amazon Fire TV. I guess I missed it, but apparently one of, I, I know Kevin, uh, our executive producer, thought one of the best interviews you ever had was this week. Um, on Tuesday, the storytelling um, guest. And so this is where you can get back to our archives. And you can also queue us up on podcasts wherever you like to download your content. Okay, nonprofit nerd, I love this image of you because thanks. I've never been here, but this is your office, right? It is. It's my home office, my home studio. Um, I live in a mid-century modern home, which I just adore. Mm -hmm. And if you adore it so much, and you know, wh why leave? <laughs> so I get to serve the community across the globe from um, from my beautiful home that I just adore. And uh, yeah, it's so nice. And um, a lot, a lot happens here. A lot. <laughs> Yeah, a lot happens here. It's super cool. Well, you know, I I always enjoy the time that I get just with you, where I can just talk with you and find out what's cooking. One of the marvelous things is that we don't always agree. We don't always have to agree, but we get really different perspectives um, from both of our diverse careers um, in the sector. And so yeah. this is going to be a really cool conversation. Again, we're talking today about one of the most frightening topics, and that is succession planning. <laughs> I feel like Kevin, our executive producer, is definitely going to take that screenshot as like our thumbnail, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. So every now and then, as our viewers and listeners know, we turn the tables on each other. So um, I decided to put myself up for the opportunity to talk about succession planning, because this is one thing I'm seeing in our community as a challenge. And it's an obstacle that um, undoubtedly we will all face, right? So I figured, okay, it's time to talk about it. One of the service lines that I provide is interim executive work. And with that executive, um, interim executive lens, Julia, I see often about the lack of succession planning. And when I talk of succession planning, I think most people think of the CEO. And that is exactly what we're going to address here. CEO, executive director, I kind of use those terms or titles interchangeably. But I also subscribe to the fact that Everyone needs a succession plan in every position, staff and board alike. So I was um, ironically at a community event yesterday evening. I saw another amazing woman here in our community who has served on many boards um, and has served in the CEO role, right, herself. And she said, I'm joining the show, show tomorrow because I'm serving as a board chair for an organization and we have no succession plan. And I'm like, you're not alone. And then additionally, I want to share with you that, you know, going through an executive search for a full-time CEO there were three final candidates at the table. Two of them recused themselves from the position because there was no succession plan at their current agency. And so I saw this as a, an opportunity to address an obstacle that we're likely all facing. And again, undoubtedly, we will all face the succession plan conversation. So I've come today with five tips, Julia, to help our audience uh, navigate this in a professional, intellectual, uh, prepared type of way. So uh, if you'll, yeah, if you'll pull up that, that number one, I say we just get started and yeah. there's 
questions, I, you know, again, I encourage our viewers, our live viewers, at least to use the Q&A at the bottom, because I want to answer your questions real time. I'm here, ask me anything as it relates to this, um, but succession planning is, is a big deal. So key step number one, again, I'm going to share five, but starting with number one is to assess the vacancies that your success plan will address, right? So we're really looking at, okay, in the CEO executive director role, when he or she leaves this position, what are the gaps, right? What are we missing? Uh, what, what do we need to address in this plan? What type of uh, leader do we need? And has the organization grown? I've worked with many organizations. When we first started together, we were, let's say a $2 million organization. And over time, 18 months, 24 months, 36 months, they've grown to like a $10 million organization. So the leader at the helm at the $2 million organization may not be the right leader for a $10 million organization. So you really need to assess those gaps of your leadership and not hire from deficiency, right? Hire from a place of what is it we need? Where are we going and how do we get there? So I, I my thoughts turn to the amazing Rita Sornan, CEO yes. of uh, the Dave Thomas Foundation. And, and Dave Thomas himself found her the founder of Wendy's found her to, to then start this organization. And she's been with them all this time. And she made the most interesting comments to us, Jared, about how they started with one way, exactly what you said, and then they've grown and changed and what they needed and how they uh, really relied on different talents and skills that Mr. Thomas and even Rita could never have foreseen this, right? Oh, yeah. So my question to you, given this, is understanding these, you know, these needs, if you want to use the word deficiencies, it seems like it's such a perilous conversation or, or metric to, to look at, because in essence, you're saying, yeah, our current CEO or even our last CEO, our founder or whatever, mm -hmm. wasn't up to snuff, didn't have this. How do you navigate that? Yeah, you know, I've had some interesting conversations around this and so much so that this this can be a perilous conversation. Oftentimes the executive director and or CEO is fearful to even bring up succession planning to their board, right? Um, so that is a little risky or can feel a little risky. But the thing is what I like to focus on, Julia, is we're talking about the best for the organization. And we're talking about legacy. We're talking about sustainability. We're talking about continuing the mission as the community needs it. So we're really putting our best foot forward by discussing succession planning because you're doing what's best for your community. And that should always be top priority and top of mind. Um, your governing board and your fiduciary agents of your organization, they should always be making mission-driven decisions and succession planning is that. I love that, I love what you just said, mission-driven you know, decisions and policies. That phrase takes the emotion out of it. it. Yes, I cannot tell you how many times this week and it's what only, oh, it's Thursday, thank goodness. I was like, and it's only Tuesday, but it's Thursday. I have said so many times, so many oh, times wow. this week, like, it's not, <laughs> I like to make you laugh, Julia. It, none of it is personal. It's all business. These are business decisions and nonprofits are a business. And so we have to look at this from that mission centered lens and perspective. Um, and again, that's what succession planning is. So for tip number one, truly, you know, look at, look at your vacancy. Uh, what type of leader do you need at the helm for this role going forward as your organization is evolving because if we're not evolving, we're dying truly. So, so, so that's then key that's step fun. number two navigates align an internal vision for your succession plan. Mm -hmm. Meaning, meaning what? Because again, this almost seems to be reinforcing to everybody what you just said that this is mission focused. It's mm -hmm. not going to be frightening. It's going to be actually positive. Is that what you're trying to communicate, or how do we mm -hmm. navigate? our teams through that fear. Yeah, I really do think, you know, we, we need to look again at succession planning across the board. 
every position, not just the executive director. If you have a chief financial officer, if you have a director of development, if you have a director of programs, this conversation should be at the table, at the leadership conversations constantly, right? Annually, biannually. So really aligning the vision for the succession plan. So maybe, and we're going to talk about this, but maybe we do have an internal candidate that we're grooming. We've seen that happen right here in our community, Julia, and it wasn't an overnight decision. It has been a long time coming and a long time grooming. That is what I would say would be like the best case scenario, but the reality is best case scenarios do not always happen. (laughs) So we need to prepare for not, you know, not having that best case scenario. So really looking at aligning the internal communications, sharing openly with the board that we do have a succession plan and it's not an envelope stuffed in the back of a cabinet drawer where you can find it. If by chance, this bus that we've all heard about takes out our entire organization, don't worry, we have a plan B That's not a succession plan. Right. I love it. Yeah. And I want to say too, and I'm very passionate and I can feel my energy like rising and palpitating. Um, The ultimate succession plan is a living trust and will for us as a human, right? So what is your living trust and will for your organization? And we have to humanize this to say, okay, the organization must continue beyond the founder, beyond the current CEO, beyond the current board. What is that plan? And it is not an envelope in the back of a cabinet that's been there for 10 years. I love it. I love that you said that because this kind of leads us to to key step number three, and that is cultivate internal talent for future transitions. This is dicey because how do you do this without guaranteeing making somebody an heir apparent, or as I used to say in The Sopranos, my favorite, hair apparent? (laughs) (laughs) You know, how do you move and yet not guarantee or cultivate? What does that look like? So in today's workforce, Julia, and we've heard a lot from a a lot of our amazing guests, but I'm channeling right now Sky Mercer, right? And she's a fantastic HR consultant. We talk about stay interviews, and that's really become a thing. Instead of an exit interview, you're talking to your staff regularly, and they're called stay interviews. You know, what, what makes you happy? Where do you see yourself in the next year, three years, five years? Learning from your team that exists what their career goals are, right? There's a lot that happens and changes in people's personal lives. Um, I was just talking to a CEO the other day and they're going through a huge milestone in their life where their child is graduating high school and they become an empty nester. That's a big life change, right? And so having these conversations, cultivating your internal talent for that future transition, they may or may not be there, Julia. They may or may not be on your current roster, your current org chart, but having these conversations to see who in the organization has the ability, the interest to take this on and what might that look like? Because if we can essentially groom someone from within Think about the opportunity to build and deepen those relationships with our stakeholders, right? Instead of that one person holding the torch and the torch going out when he or she leaves, the torch remains bright. And that's what we want to do. And we've seen that happen so beautifully here in our community recently. Yeah, recently a major, major organization with that's about a hundred million dollar budget that navigated a a transition um beautifully and it's tough even Mm -hmm. even as as wonderful as you can have identified everybody and you don't have crisis and and, you know you're all good to go and you're all whole it's still a challenge and i think it is important to understand that and to um kind of honor that this process that jarrett's talking about is certainly not easy nor is it for the faint of heart Now, I'm really interested in this, and I want to spend a little bit more time on this key step number four, and that is outline the executive search phase. And off camera, I asked you this question, Jarrett, and I'll I'll do it publicly. Do you find that most boards and even C-suite are out of touch with what the process is and more importantly, the time needed to deal with this process? I'm trying not to laugh, but 100% out of touch. And I would say 
nine to 12 months is the realistic timeline of bringing in a full-time executive level. Um, I, again, I serve as that interim executive uh, CEO, COO, CDO in the fundraising realm. And in that, it, it is nine to 12 months. That is essentially what it's going to take. Because first of all, you know, you really want to find the person if they're not internal. And again, as an interim, and I do wave that flag high and proud because I believe so wholeheartedly in bringing in an interim executive leader as part of the succession planning process, right? So, so I come in, I help you evaluate all of the the previous key steps that we've talked about, assessing the vacancy, I do that as an interim executive leader. Aligning the internal vision and communications with stakeholders, we do that in our role as an interim executive leader. We cultivate internal talent because we can see with a fresh perspective without any previous political, you know, political um, insight to say, hey, this person here, I, I think they're your guy or I think they're your person. Like, And I've done that. I was working for an organization in Seattle. And I literally within the first week, Julia, I said to the executive director, I said, you've got your girl right here. I just had coffee with her this morning. And they're like, really? I didn't think they were ready. And I was like, she's ready. This, this is what they need to do it, but she's right here in front of you. And so bringing in an interim can help with that. But Realistically, I would plan nine to 12 months to bring in an executive level person. Um, you know, it takes it takes some time, plus making the assumption they're probably at an executive level or a director level at another organization. Yes. So they need to do due diligence with their agency, just as you would want them to do with yours. They need to give, I would say, at least 30 days notice, if not 90 day notice when they're exiting oh, yeah. their previous place. Yeah. You know, one of the things that you taught me early on, and I think it's just fascinating, and I, and I don't want to move on to our next step without having you amplify this, and that's the notion that is so fascinating and might be somewhat shocking or counterintuitive to certain people, but the interim director never is considered for this job. Mm -hmm if they want to put their hat in the ring or if they're being asked to do it, then they need to step back. Is that true? Absolutely. And I will tell you, I've probably done about 12 in my career so far, 12 interim executive positions. Mm -hmm. I would say uh, all 12 have asked me to stay. <laughs> <laughs> Right. The board knows you. They get comfortable. The staff knows you. They get comfortable. It's the easy decision on the board's part. But as a board uh, member, it is your fiduciary right to not take the easy steps. You have to do what's right. Mission centric. Right. And so if I were to say, hey, I'm really interested in this. I'd really like to stay. Right. I've now got all the cards in my hand. I've got all the advantage in my hand. And so bringing in a professional interim executive should not ever be considered for that full-time position. If they are considered, just as you said, Julia, they need to remove themselves from that interim role. Yeah, I think that's really important. And, and I think it dovetails to the notion of you know, you're looking at board members who've got a lot of other things on their plate. And so they're uh -huh. looking around saying, how do we tick the box and we get somebody managing this ship and and then I can move on to other things. But it's not that easy. It's not that easy. The other thing I see and I do not approve of is a board member being in transition or in retirement or in some place in their life where they say, I'll do it. I'll take the role. I'll take it on. And it's like, no, you have just done a disservice to your peers, to the organization, to the community at large. Um, so I really advise against that. I've seen it. I've absolutely seen it, but I've 100% seen it go awry. Yeah. And I think it's not, uh, to me when I hear that, and I have been involved in that, I would say, um, you know, it's not professional. It's not no. a professional approach. It's kind of like a Band-Aid. And, mm -hmm. and if you can navigate through this new professional class of leadership called interim CEOs or, you know, interim C-suite, it's just going to set the organization up yeah. so much better. I mean, I feel like 
Jared, you can tell the groups that they make a rash decision and then they're back at it 10, 12, 16 months later trying to find somebody new versus if they stay the course and they're methodical and thoughtful, then they they have a stronger base. Yeah. And you know what, Julia, I see it. It, um, it damages culture. It damages stakeholder communications and relationships. And I think you're being very generous by 16 months down the road. I see it happen way too often um, earlier, six, eight months into the transition. If they've chosen what is considered an easy path, it's just, it, it, it might be easy, but it's not, it's not going to be the longevity. It's smart. No, it's not smart. Okay, now this is going to be our last topic, which I can't wait to d- dig into this because I think you and I have different perspectives. And that is transition the individual into their new role. And I was talking about this with you again uh, in the green room chatter. Yeah. I'm astonished by the number of CEOs that will come to me and say, you know, I was hired and I, and everyone knew who the CEO, the previous CEO was. Nobody ever set anything up for a conversation. No one reached out. I just showed up and sat down at a desk. Mm -hmm. And what for me is such a missed opportunity and really poor leadership transition. You have maybe a little different spin to, to, to think about, don't you? Yeah, I don't, I don't believe in that wholeheartedly. Not, not all situations. I think that is a requirement for, so when it comes to transitioning this individual role or this individual rather into their new role, I really think it depends on the situation, right? And when I serve again as interim executive, um, you know, I serve, I serve in many ways, but oftentimes it's a triage situation, meaning there was no succession plan and there was no, you know, like, uh, runway of knowledge of the CEO or, or COO or CDO leaving. And so it's not really in a healthy position. Um, so the, it's a lot of that, I think, that that I'm seeing. Now, if you have the ability and it's healthy and you have a wonderful relationship with the CEO, maybe he, she, or they are retiring. We've seen that a lot right now where yeah. A lot of C-suites have stayed in their, you know, in the position they had a plan to retire, but due to COVID-19, they said, I'll hold on to the reins. I'm here. I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm going to keep us steady. I'm going to keep us floating. We're moving into year three, year four, actually, of COVID. And so we have a lot of tenured professionals that are exhausted and they are well past their retirement plan. Yeah, they're ready to leave. You know, um, Talk to me a little bit about the shepherding of an interim with a new CEO. Yeah. Is, is that part of this or do you just like, you so know, that's, you yeah, that's Friday interesting. And they start on a Monday. Like, what does that look like? Well, when I come in, I, I, one of the first things I do is an organizational health assessment. So it really is an analysis of all moving pieces of the organization that is given to the board. And it's also given to the new hire, right? So, so they have that to say, okay, a professional came in, they pulled back the curtains, they, they rolled up the rugs and they looked at everything in the organization. They've pulled out the skeletons, the dust bunnies, the, you know, oh, nobody's supposed to see that. Let's not talk about that. Like we find them. That's our job is to find them. It's risk assessment, right? So what I tend to do though, is I will provide some type of a transition, but I tell the board, you are no longer able to contact me. I am not accessible to you as a board. I am accessible to the new hire because the board has got to entrust the confidence, the rapport, and all decision-making to the new hire. Because once that person is in place, the interim or the former CEO should never be the one making decisions. So if I have a board member contact me, I just redirect them, you know, and say, you know, as a friendly reminder, this is for the CEO. I'm no longer in that capacity. They are able to contact me. The CEO can certainly contact me because I also believe in institutional knowledge transition. And, you know, I want to share that. So, so we do that. Um, I do that. I should say it's not always a cookie cutter approach for all interims, but I, I do think it's really important 
just as it is sitting down with former board members to know the institutional knowledge and the historical milestones of an organization. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. it's it almost seems like it's um, a segue into coaching. It is. It is a segue into coaching. Absolutely. But one thing I want to bring up on this tip in the transition is a PR plan, a public relations communications plan mm -hmm. for all stakeholders, right? Internal, external, maybe there's a press release, maybe you have a publication, you know, in your community that you really want to honor mm -hmm. the past executive. You can certainly do that in a timely manner. If they are able to introduce the incoming CEO, fantastic. If not, that's okay, right? And I would also highlight the incoming CEO separately so that you are able to announce that person to the community. Um, so I really do think a strong PR communication plan helps to set you up for a successful CEO succession planning and transition. I love that you brought that up. Of course, you're speaking my love language. <laughs> you know, absolutely. Yeah. And we don't do that enough because then it looks like uh, sometimes that leadership change is a corrective issue. And, and you know, we don't want to do that. We want to maintain yeah. those champions and those links to what, you know, what has been moving forward yeah. without hindering that new leader. I mean, that's yeah. a good thing. I really want to say, and I, and I hear you and I know that it can seem like corrective. And that's why if we don't tell our story, yeah. people will tell our story for us. Exactly. Succession planning and, and new hires in this role, it's strategic. Yeah. It's not corrective. It's strategic, regardless of the situation. It could be a triage. You could something, something bad could have happened, yeah. but it's still strategic in how you're handling this for the organization moving forward. So that's your message, right? And again, we've learned this from, from many of our marketing people. Oh, yeah. If we don't tell our story, it will be told for us. Absolutely. Absolutely. We want to be able to, to navigate that forward. Well, you are always one of my favorite guests. Well, thank you. Jarrett Ransom, nonprofit nerd, CEO of the Raven Group. Um, what an amazing vision that you have of this beloved sector of ours. I mean, you, you've been able to see and be part of so many different things. And it's just, it comes through every time we're able to talk, whether we're, yeah. you know, in the rare occasions having coffee together. Mm -hmm. um, but for most of you, out there, you know, we don't see one another except every day for 30 minutes on the right show. Here. <laughs> so it's yeah. really cool to be able to have you all to myself and really get your um, vision and, and your values and your wisdom. So Jarrett Ransom, again, nonprofit nerd, um, the woman that when she was tapped on the shoulder to say, hey, what about this crazy idea for a show during COVID? She yeah. said yes. And so I told that story last night. Um, I was like, you know, Julia said it'd be two weeks. I said, yes, here we are coming up on 700 episodes, moving into year four. And we're still saying yes every day, but I love it. I'm passionate about our sector. That's why I call myself the nonprofit nerd. But if anyone needs help with their succession planning, reach out to me. It's definitely a service line that I offer. Would love to walk you through this process so that it is successful, no pun intended. Uh, for your organization, because I believe wholeheartedly in the great work that we do in our community. And I want everyone to experience this in a very positive manner. So thank you for allowing me to nerd out on this succession planning topic today, Julia. Oh my God. It's been a lot of fun. Again, I'm Julia Patrick. As you all know, we've been joined by Jared R. Ransom, the nonprofit nerd herself, CEO of the Raven Group. Again, we want to thank all of our generous sponsors, Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Be Generous, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and of course, Nonprofit Nerd. Wow. Okay, Jarrett, go forth and do great things today, my friend. Thank you. Thank you for holding down the fort. Um, tomorrow, I'll be in the hot seat with somebody from Fundraising Academy for our Friday. And... Uh, That'll be a lot of fun. So join us then. Absolutely. Thank you. Hey, thank you. And as we like to remind everyone, stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone.